welcome to episode 147 of the Postal Hub podcast. I'm Ian Kerr. Mark Harrison, head of markets at International Post Corporation, joins me to talk about the IPC's Global Postal Industry Report. Before we get to Mark, a quick reminder that Market Forces Leaders in Logistics, Post and Parcel Europe is on in Madrid from the 26th to the 28th of March. It features some great speakers from National Posts and Parcel Carriers. Areas. Go to thepostalhub.com slash events for more information. Coming up in just a moment, Mark Harrison from the IPC. Joining me on the line is Mark Harrison. Mark is Head of Markets at the International Post Corporation, and we're going to be talking about a report that the IPC recently released. And Mark, why don't we start with a little bit about the report before we dive into the details, because some very interesting findings that have come out of this report. Can you just uh, tell us a little bit about the, well, what, the title, what the title of the report is, for starters, and how it was put together? Yes, thanks very much, Ian. So the uh, report that we're talking about is the IPC Global Postal Industry Report. Uh, This is an annual publication that we do, and it's really to understand the trends in the postal industry and to enable uh, posts to benchmark their performance against peers and an industry average. So the report's in two parts. Uh, The first part is looking at the overall industry trends, and the second part is giving a detailed performance comparison across individual postal operators. We've done this report now for 10 years, and over that time, it's really expanded, completely changed. We're now analyzing 50 posts from Asia Pacific, Europe, North America, and the BRICS countries, as well as the integrators such as UPS and FedEx. And we're summarizing all of this in a key findings that represents a good distillation of data and analysis, and that can be downloaded from the IPC Web Center, and that's the key findings of our global postal industry reports. Well, why don't we start with the big question, how is the industry evolving? Well, let's be honest about it. I mean, posts are delivering far fewer letters and many more e-commerce packets and parcels than they were 10 years ago. The competition has intensified as mail markets have become liberalized and the postal market has become a lot more vibrant. So really, posts have developed a much more commercial focus as private ownership has increased. We've now got 10 posts that are listed on the local stock exchanges. And the industry has also become more diversified and developed with a strong focus on e-commerce logistics. So just to give you a few trends, the postal industry, well, last year it reached uh, 392 billion euros, and that was up 7.2 billion on the previous year. And mail, it still remains the industry's largest segment, but it did decline by about 3 billion on aggregates. Um, Meanwhile, parcels and logistics, they're the two engines of industry growth, and they were up 9 billion and 1.5 billion, respectively. Now, both segments are being fueled by e-commerce, and e-commerce now accounts for over one-third of total postal industry revenue. I want to get to those e-commerce revenues in a moment, but let's just start with letters. You mentioned that letters are in decline, and one of the Um, drivers of that is e-substitution. And behind e-substitution is the fact that more citizens are getting connected to the internet. So have you been able to find out anything about what's driving this digital connectivity, which then is affecting this e-substitution? Well, as you say, and it's that connectivity to the internet. I mean, the global internet uses that grew to 3.6 billion in uh, 2017. And that was 48% of the world's population, up 20% from a decade ago. And really, as broadband networks expand, um, we're going to have far more people online using data across the globe. Um, Mobile devices are fast becoming the preferred way for consumers to access digital content, and the number of devices and connections per user keep increasing every year. So we're now in a situation where one third of the world's inhabitants are active smartphone and social network users, and more and more consumers are buying goods online. And then let's talk about the volume declines. The report you said has been you've been doing the report for ten years, and that in if I've got it right, the volume decline over those ten years has been something in the order of, or for some posts, fifty percent. 
So what? That, but that's a big difference between the, some of the, the posts that have lost a lot of volume versus the posts that have not lost so much volume in letters. What have been some of the factors behind that? Well, you, you're right. I mean, that is the correct figure. Some posts have seen decline by uh, more than 50% over the last uh, decade, but it does vary. I mean, if we look at the ones that have declined the most, uh, one is Post Nord in Denmark, which has seen mail volume fall by almost three quarters since uh, 2007, and it's declined every year since its volume peaked in 1999. The big story there, and I'd say probably more generally in the Nordic market, it's the high degree of digitization amongst business, uh, governments, and consumers. Indeed, if you look at Denmark, Finland, Norway, and Sweden, they are among some of the most digitized countries in the world. In Denmark, over 86% of the population um, communicate with their government through um, electronic communication services. And it's not just the governments that have shifted communications online as well. Other large customers, such as banks, utility companies, they've switched to the digital mail um, to issue their bills, their statements and invoices. Um, For example, Post Norge's transactional mail volume fell by 10.4% in 2017, um, but it reported a a significantly faster volume decline for customers in key sectors like banking and finance. They were declining at nearly minus 27%. Posts are addressing this. They've introduced digital mailboxes to try and capture some of those digital volumes. But really, I think it's the acceptance that posts want to try and maintain their volumes for mail, but they are very much looking to the e-commerce opportunities and to the opportunities we have, particularly with packets. And that's one of the key things that the GPIR is highlighting. Well, a couple more things on letters before we move on to parcels. Uh, There's always a debate about uh, pricing of letters and volume decline. Uh, The the, the, um, point of view often expressed in mainstream media is, well, if the letter pricing goes up, it will fuel further declines. And that's not necessarily always the case. Are you able to share any insight into how the letter pricing may or may not contribute to volume declines? It's a very valid question. And obviously, as you say, something that's occupied uh, a lot of press in, in, in the mainstream media. But, I mean, maintaining a vast postal network that delivers to all addresses almost every day of the week involves high fixed expenses. And as volumes decrease, the average cost per mail item has increased. Uh, I, I, I can't counter that. Um, so posts have responded to the pressures really through targeted um, efficiency initiatives to modernize the network. Um, these range from consolidating the mail facilities, simplifying uh, their portfolios, but they've also, as you say, been increasing their letter rates to reflect the rising cost of mail delivery in the digital era. For example, of the 50 posts that we cover in the report, more than half have increased their domestic consumer rates since 2012, and cumulative um, price increases range from between 10% and 90%. But what I can tell you, listeners, Ian, there's a great example uh, that we can take from Unpost in Ireland. Unpost recently, well, in 2017, increased the price of their postage stamp by 38%, taking it up to one euro. And they noted the mail volume declines after the increase were actually a lot less than they had predicted through their economic uh, modeling. And I think really that was a good testament to the strength of the Ampos brand. They did a very good communication where they went through the media to say, uh, the reason we're doing this is to maintain this universal service obligation. And I think consumers accepted that and businesses accepted it. And indeed, Uh, The volumes didn't fall as much as expected, and the quality and service and the the value of the Ampos brand played a large part in being able to position that increase and to make it acceptable to businesses and consumers alike. And one of the things you touched on there was this universal service obligation, and that so many posts are still under some sort of universal service obligation. Yeah. Uh, given the volume declines uh, and in in the last ten years, have we seen any 
a movement towards changing the USO in some countries? Well, certainly there have been changes uh, to the USO uh, and to changes to national regulations. Uh, These have included fewer delivery days, for example, or more lenient delivery times and greater price flexibility. Now, these have helped some posts to adapt to changing customer needs and have helped to cover the USO-related costs. Let's go on to parcels then, because this is the flip side of the internet's impact on the postal sector. We've seen growth in parcel volumes in most, if not all, Uh, developed markets for the post at least. Uh, But I've seen some figures that suggest that the parcel volumes delivered by the post, or the growth I should say, in parcel volumes delivered by the post is behind the actual growth in e-commerce as a sector. Do you have any insights into that? Yeah, you're right, Ian. The e-commerce is certainly growing faster than um, the posts are growing their parcel uh, business. Posts have grown their parcel volume, it will have doubled over the last decade. And while that's impressive, um, if you actually look at the uh, total online retail, that's quadrupled over the same period. Now, one reason for the gap is the significant share of e-commerce items that are classed as lightweight packets, and therefore they're recorded as mail and not as parcels. So this relates to the accounting and the business unit setup of um, postal operators. So for example, a parcel is often classed as over two kilograms. So for example, it would be accounted for in Royal Mail's parcel force network, for example, whereas the packets are encountered, uh, sorry, are accounted for within the letters. So we're seeing a lot of growth in the packets And we think that that's probably growing much more in alignment with the total um, scale of the e-commerce growth. But one of the things that I've noticed that a growing number of posts are doing is that they're teaming up with startups to try and um, uh, capture more of those e-commerce, more more e-commerce parcels. Uh, Have you got a couple of examples you can share with us? I mean, competition is just so intense for e-commerce. There's so many new entrants. Uh, Le Groupe La Poste, that acquired a majority stake in Stewart in 2017. Now, that's a last-mile crowdsourced delivery startup, which connects businesses to freelance couriers to provide on-demand urban delivery in France and other European countries. So, Posts are also incubating their own startups. Australia Post, for example, has done this uh, via its warehousing and fulfillment services, uh, Fulfilio, which helps SMEs simplify their logistics. But the key thing about this is this driver, which is the competition. And really, we have to look to what else is going on in the market. E-retail giants such as uh, JD.com in China, they're investing in logistics. Uh, They're flexing their digital muscle. And I think also Amazon, as they're moving and they're investing more into delivery, this is where the competition is. There are the click and collect operations, as you referred to, but there is just so much competition, crowdsourced delivery, e-retailer delivery. And that's why I think the rate of e-commerce is even faster than that of the post, but it's a huge market to go for and it's a growth that is really providing plenty of opportunities for the IPC members. And you mentioned that there is a lot of competition there and that has to have some sort of a a squeeze effect on margins on parcels. Does the report uh, give any uh, overviews of of how margins are tracking for the sector? It it does, yes. Um, Well, Growth in both the domestic and cross-border e-commerce is driving the parcels revenue for many posts. Um, On average, the growth in parcels and express revenue accelerated to 10.8%. Now, in terms of profitability and those margins, uh, EBIT dipped uh, to 7.1% in 2017, but it does remain robust overall. So on one side, the prices are under pressure due to the stronger bargaining power of the large e-retailers and also the expectations of consumers as well. More and more each year, consumers are getting used to the free delivery 
and there's just so much competition and competitors undercutting each other. So on the other hand, costs are driven up by the rising uh, labor expenses and network upgrades, and also the integration of the acquired firms. So really, for these reasons, the posts are continuing to focus on improving their cost efficiency, and they're doing this in a number of ways. So uh, if I think about automation, Deutsche Post, DHL, the group La Poste, and Posti, they're all sorting over 95% of their parcels uh, by machine. Uh, That was their statistic for 2017, the year that we're analyzing in the GPIR, whereas others are integrating their mail and parcel networks. So Australia Post reports that over 40% of their parcels were delivered by its posties in 2017, um, where Posti Italiani was looking to roughly triple the number of parcels its mail carriers were delivering by 2022. So it really is the focus for posts is to be able to deliver far more parcels packets within the networks as we move forward. Of course, just mentioning Post Italiane, they uh, in the last 12 months signed a deal with Amazon to deliver a lot more parcels for Amazon and deliver in the evening and even on weekends. So I reckon we can probably work out where a lot of that volume growth is going to come from for our colleagues in Italy. Mark, at the beginning, you mentioned diversification and you mentioned um, Fulfilio uh, just a moment ago, the uh, e-commerce fulfillment company startup that's uh, part of the Australia Post group now. So let's just talk a little bit about some of this diversification that's happening in posts. What what's what are, what are we seeing? Uh, are posts moving into logistics, like fulfillment or warehousing? Or what's happening there? Uh, absolutely. I mean, posts are looking to capture more of the e-commerce value chain, and that is through warehousing, it's for order fulfillment, uh, through uh, returns management. I talked about Australia, for example, but also another example is New Zealand Post, and that's offering local businesses warehousing and fulfillment services via its third-party logistics division. Um, it's fulfilling orders with the uh, from their operational centers across the country. But I think the thing that we have to do is understand the speed at which this um, market is evolving. It's very much driven by the giants of global e-retail, and they're taking more and more market share each year. So Alibaba, for example, that aims to reduce their delivery times for orders outside of China to three days. I mean, that's a three-day global delivery. That's what's been stated by China, uh, their operations uh, logistics uh, division. So it plans to invest 13 billion euros in global logistics between 2017 and 2022. So this is driving the changes. Each year, Amazon gets closer and closer to the end customer through its delivery offices. And I think that's where posts need to be very careful. The market has been driven by the big retailers, and they have to keep pace with them and really engage. Um, this is what we're seeing more and more now. It's the posts speaking at a strategic level with the logistics directors of the big e-commerce customers to really understand what are their needs, what is their growth strategy, and what role can posts play a part in. The dialogue that posts were having with retailers was more about discounts of pricing, but now they're really becoming a strategic partner and they're able to engage and have a good discussion based on the analysis, the market intelligence we present in the GPIR, but also on all the data that we have from our shopper survey, where we uh, do research in 41 different countries uh, and we can represent the voice of the consumer when we have this dialogue. So IPC is trying to provide plenty of intelligence of research so that posts can really understand and work with these big, uh, biggest global e-retailers. And I think it's interesting what you said about uh, Alibaba looking to fulfill globally within, what was it, three days? Three days, yeah. Uh, I think there's going to be a, a reckoning on that at some point when people will say, well, hang on a second, look at the carbon footprint of some of these deliveries. You know, is it worth is it worth the price we're pay- paying in terms of emissions and all of that to have 
you know, something delivered express to the other side of the planet. I reckon there's going to be a bit of a reckoning there. However, I'll stop the editorialising, Mark, and maybe ask you another <laughs> question. Um, I want to ask about international revenue as well for posts. Because if you go turn back the clock many years, can you turn back a clock years? I don't know. Anyway, if you go back <laughs> back many years, posts really only operated within their borders. And nowadays, so many posts operate cross-border. How are you seeing uh, posts growing their international revenue? Well, the international revenue uh, now represents close to one quarter of uh, total revenue on average. And so the shares range considerably across the group. So most posts have grown their international revenue since 2012. Uh Five posts now have an average annual growth uh, for international revenue above 10%. So they're doing that through new services, through acquisitions, uh, joint ventures and partnerships. Um, if I look at uh, some of the big European players, both uh, Le Groupe La Poste and Royal Mail, they're deriving one quarter of their total revenue from international markets, and they've recently made acquisitions to expand um, into uh, further regions. Uh, other operators have made large-scale acquisitions as well to enter new markets. Japan Post, um, that's been controversial in Australia, uh, moving through its acquisition of the Australian firm, the Toll Group, which it bought for $4.3 billion in 2015. So it purchased the second largest uh, logistics division. And then others are really uh, focused on acquiring smaller firms, uh, for example, Bpost has recently acquired uh, Lien Menken, which is a Dutch food logistics specialist, and that's to help it realize its ambition to become the market leader in fresh food delivery in the Benelux region. So different posts, different strategies, but really I think it reflects e-commerce. It's a global business, and so posts have to provide global solutions. And that's one of the things at a global level that IPC has been working on. We have our interconnect uh, cross-border e-commerce network, and that's providing connectivity for end-to-end -end services through 31 different posts in Europe, North America, and Asia Pacific. So you're right, as you say, the international element is growing far more, and that's reflected in cross-border e-commerce as well, where the cross-border e-commerce is growing even faster than the domestic. So really, um, through these networks, our participants are expecting to increase their cross-border volumes in the future. One last thing before we wrap up. Let's have a look towards the future. Um, out of these reports that the IPC has been doing over the last 10 years, what are the major trends that you've identified that you think will shape the postal sector in 2019 and beyond? Well, I think really it's that Continuous e-substitution and e-commerce. I mean, I, I keep going on about the same things, but those are the drivers. Um, it's this market concentration that's increasing. Amazon and e Alibaba, they're now accounting for one in every three euros that are spent online. And both of these are steadily building their logistics networks as the online and the physical worlds continue to blur. Amazon, for example, it's doubled its global fulfillment center network, and it recently ordered 20,000 Amazon branded vans for its subcontracted drivers. So you say that we can't predict the future, but I'm talking about Amazon, so sort of my mind has just uh, returned to a quote from Jeff Bezos, where he was asked about predicting the future, and he said, well, it's far easier to say what customers will not require in 10 years time. And he said, customers never come through to him saying, in 10 years time, I want a more expensive delivery service, or in 10 years time, I want a slower delivery service. So these are the trends. We have to look at the network. There has to be efficiencies. We have to further reduce costs, and we have to improve the delivery times. I think that's the number one requirement from consumers. It's faster delivery times. And IPC uses this information for the dialogue with our members. Uh, so we engage with our operations colleagues and really to make the point that this is such a dynamic, fast-changing marketplace that we have to continually challenge our standards, look at our reporting. We have to deliver faster. So I think that's the big trend for the future. 
The report is available to all of IPC members. It's available to purchase by non-members and it can be accessed via the IPC website. And what's the web address there, Mark? I'll, give, I'll let you finish off the plug. What's the address? <laughs> Thanks for the sales plug in. Yeah, it's www.ipc.be. And if you go to the section that we have on market intelligence, you'll be able to download that report, the key findings of it. So there you go. Look, thank you very much, Mark, for sharing an insight into some of the report's highlights there and uh, looking towards the future. Uh, plenty of trends there for us to bear in mind as the delivery sector moves forward in 2019. Mark Harrison, Head of Markets at International Post Corporation, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Ian. It's been a pleasure. That's all for this episode of the Postal Hub podcast. Remember to subscribe to the podcast. You can subscribe in iTunes or Apple Podcasts, on Spotify and on Google Podcasts. And that way you'll get each episode downloaded to the device of your choosing each week. And you'll be able to listen to all 147 episodes as well on your device, your phone, your whatever it might be. Now, Also, if you haven't already, please do sign up for the Postal Hub e-newsletter. It's the weekly email update which includes the latest episode along with any other news or articles I've written during the week. If you're on LinkedIn and you'd like to connect, please do send me an invitation to connect. But as I say each week, remember to send a message saying that you're a Postal Hub listener and that way I'll accept your invitation to connect. And if you want to contact me about anything at all, just send me an email. My email address is ian at thepostalhub.com. I'm Ian Kerr. Thanks for listening in, and I look forward to your company next time on the Postal Hub podcast.